Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good morning. Uh, good morning to friends in Japan and the rest of Asia. Uh, good afternoon or good evening to our audience in the United States. Um, I am Matthew Goodman. I'm Senior Vice President for Economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, in Washington, D.C., and delighted to have you with us for this uh, conference on uh, U.S.-Japan cooperation on high-tech uh, supply chain security. Uh, we are delighted to be partnering in this um, event with our friends at the Japan um, Institute for International Affairs, or JIIA, in Tokyo, uh, which is a longstanding and wide-ranging uh, partner of CSIS. We've done a lot of things with them over the years, and we are delighted to be able to do this event um, on this very timely topic uh, with them today. I'm particularly uh, pleased to be joined uh, by JIIA friends uh, today because uh, they have been recently named the top think tank in the world uh, by uh, the University of Pennsylvania in their most recent annual survey of think tanks, thousands of think tanks around the world. JIIA was number one. So uh, we're delighted and honored uh, to, be, um, to be partnering with them on this event and sort of more generally as well. So congratulations to Ambassador Sasai, who I will introduce in just a second. Um, but uh, I, I'm going to just uh, say a few words about this event before I hand it over. Um, first, by just telling a little story. Exactly one year ago this week, I flew to Tokyo for what turned out to be my last international trip. Um, and I was speaking at a conference. When I arrived at the conference, the organizers of the conference handed me a pack of six uh, surgical masks. And they said, Mr. Goodman, you will need these uh, while you're in Japan. You will not be able to buy them in a store because they've all sold out because everyone's been trying to get masks at the very beginning of the pandemic. And it was quite a sort of shocking uh, reminder of how important supply chains are um, in that case for what turned out to be quite an important uh, essential item. But of course, Supply chains have been around for a long time and have been an important issue in a lot of different areas. And this was just a reminder of how important they are and what happens when they get disrupted. Um, you know, whether multinational companies trying to decide where to put their next dollar of investment and how to move goods around the world, or governments who are concerned about uh, supplies of critical materials, uh, minerals, or technologies. Um, these supply chain issues are, are kind of everywhere and they're a very hot topic right now and we're delighted to be having an opportunity to talk about them. It is a huge topic, so we're going to try to refine it a little bit um, and narrow it a little bit by talking mostly about high technology supply chains, um, also by talking more about um, security related dimensions of this story rather than questions of cost or efficiency, although inevitably we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and then also specifically by focusing on how the United States and Japan see these issues and how uh, these two allies can work together um, or where there may be difficulties in working together. We want to explore uh, those issues as well. Um, so with that, um, I think I'm going to now with no further ado, hand over um, the, um, the microphone to Ambassador Kenichiro Sasai who, as everyone knows, is the president of JIA, but he's also former ambassador to the United States and a good friend of us at CSIS, and I think probably well known to everyone on this call. So uh, Ambassador Sasai, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mashi Goodman. And I also glad to, to see both Japanese, American, and Asian friends online. It's great to have this uh, webinar together with all of you. As uh, Mashi Goodman, my friend, Matt said uh, a moment ago, about a year ago, uh, we had a uh, good breakfast in, in one of the hotels down in Tokyo. And um, we were uh, just wondering 
whether we could have a, a seminar uh, together and uh, on the high tech and uh, state uh, economic craft and, and all the other issues. And uh, at the time, exactly this COVID-19 was beginning to make impact, but we didn't know how long it was going on. But almost a year has passed, we are still struggling. But in spite of all these difficulties, it's great to get come to get to have this uh, seminar together with you. Uh, today, um, you know, uh, we have uh, quite a good lineup uh, on the Japanese side. And later on, there was introduction, there will be introductions, uh, you know, uh, Miss Ichikawa, uh, who, who is uh, uh, the uh, promoted, I would say, uh, to be a director general. Uh, she used to be acting before, but she's now full-fledged, uh, you know, director general of the Institute. Uh, of course, I will continue to do my own job. I just wanted to introduce uh, the initial set of this gathering. Uh, on the Japanese side, uh, there will be uh, Mr. Tsugami and, and Professor Suzuki. They are quite expert, both on Chinese issues and high-tech issues. So I'm sure that they will be a great, great uh, participant to make the uh, debate interesting. Uh, today, uh, uh, we would address the, uh, the high-tech supply chain issues. Uh, this is uh, very important, as we all know, uh, under the current context of uh, Sino-American conflict and competition. But this is not simply um, about how we would uh, address the issues around China. It's also related to our own uh, you know, economic security and further our own national securities. So, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, <clears throat> our own collaborations, uh, you know, uh, with the United States, uh, and uh, in doing so, we can't simply talk about how we would confront and compete. We have to also figure out how we could even cooperate with China, even under high tech, you know, competition. So this is a kind of very difficult and dilemma. We all know it. But still, I think experts could discuss how to how to address these issues, um, how we would uh, cooperate together and uh, digital and high tech collaboration. There are several things. I don't have to get into all the details, but it is obvious we don't have any rule governing the world yet. So uh, it, it's going to be very tough. But uh, I believe that Japan and the United States uh, could work together to lead setting the benchmark of the global rule and even regional rule. So uh, I, uh, I'm very much looking forward uh, to having a good discussion with all of you. Thank you very much. And we, I welcome all of you. So my name is Tomiko Ichikawa. I'm a moderator for session one entitled China's 14th five-year plan and dual circulation strategy. As the title shows, this session will focus on China's 14th five-year plan and dual circulation strategy, kind of setting the scene for the second session in which how Japan and US could cooperate will be discussed. We have two excellent experts on these matters. Mr. Jude Blanchett, Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS, and Mr. Toshia Tsugami, adjunct fellow at JAYA. We expect them to speak about how recent policy documents of China will impact China's technology self-sufficiency strategy and China's role in global supply chains. As the time is short, I would like to request these two discussants to limit their presentation to within, uh, within 10 minutes each and then I'd like to open floor to uh, take floor, take questions from audience and maybe also have discussions between the discussants. Uh, just as a ground rule, uh, for those speakers, uh, sorry, for those audience members who may wish to submit their questions or comments, please do so by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to request Mr. Blanchett, our first speaker, to take the floor. Uh, Mr. Blanchett, the floor is yours. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to join this uh, important discussion. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing the, the comments of the other speakers tonight, given how um, important this topic is. I wanted to make just a, a few comments here, a framing comment, and then I wanted to discuss in depth um, the, the dual circulation strategy. And because I will be mindful of time, uh, if, if I have a minute left, I, may, I will discuss the 14th five-year plan. But just a few um, top line comments. One is it's clear right now that we're in the middle of a profound shift in China's economic development model. One that is clearly moved out of the reform and opening uh, a period which began in the late 1970s and now towards a, a development model which is much more intentional um, in where it uses and channels uh, resources um, and channeling those to ensure that China is essentially achieving predetermined ends as defined by the party state. And I, I hope to explore that a bit more uh, in, in my remarks, but it's the word intentional, which I think is um, a, an important component of this new model. Clearly the, 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 the days when Beijing was comfortable allowing market forces to allocate resources um, is over. And now given the stakes that Beijing sees, much more guidance is needed uh, by the party state to ensure that China reaches some of these uh, uh, these technological ends that I'll discuss. Um, I think many experts think that what's driving this shift is Xi Jinping's or Beijing's diagnosis about an increasingly hostile external environment, including strategic competition with the United States, as well as competition with many of, of US allies and partners. But I actually think the main thrust behind what I call Xi Jinping's technological solutionism is Xi's belief that Technology is really the key to tackling almost all of China's domestic or mounting domestic challenges, whether that's productivity, whether that's demographic challenges, or whether that's a good old fashioned corporate debt. Um, and so while I'm gonna argue that geopolitical realities are, are strengthening, uh, I think Beijing's resolve here, I think it's important to keep in mind that this is not just a reaction to the external environment, that indeed there's a powerful motivating domestic force here I mean, that is the belief that technology can help China solve many of its domestic challenges. Let me spend a few minutes talking about dual, dual circulation. Um, uh, as the Communist Party is wont to do, it, it picks relatively turgid phrases and names for its economic policies. Um, but let me just start out with what dual circulation is not. Um, dual circulation, despite the rhetoric from Beijing about self-sufficiency, um, Beijing cannot afford to wall itself off. And so when you hear uh, within uh, the context of discussions of dual circulation, the idea of self-sufficiency, think of that as a process rather than an end state. Beijing, I think like many economies, um, is looking to essentially strengthen or leverage domestic demand uh, and build up domestic production capabilities and capacities more than it's looking to realistically wall the country off. And indeed, we saw last year, China was the largest recipient of, of foreign direct investment, a trend that Beijing is very much looking to, uh, looking to further uh, uh, prolong. Instead, I think, um, as mentioned above, this is about uh, really shifting China's uh, economic model from uh, external exposure to volatile, uh, uncontrollable elements to one that's much more what, we, what they call in Beijing secure and controllable, essentially ensuring that the domestic is doing a lot more of the work in driving China's growth. Um, and indeed, uh, the, 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 what many of the discussions we're gonna have, have here tonight and, and the rhetoric coming out of the Biden administration about a new approach to confrontation or, or, or competition with China, China's reading those newspaper articles too. And so, it has diagnosed what it feels like is a long-term secular, um, uh, more hostile international environment. And so I think this was put well by uh, Zhang Mo'an when she said, it's not so much that we're in, a, we're in an era of deglobalization, it's that we're returning to an era of economic sovereignty, very much a concept Beijing is, is used to. Um, and indeed, I think that's a smart way to put it for how Beijing sees this. National security is now the dominant optic through which Beijing makes assessments about economic policies. 
um, and, and solving these internal contradictions and ensuring that China is being put on a more secure uh, economic footing to, to be able to, to sort of get through the next 15 or 20 years is at the heart of what Xi Jinping is trying to do. Now, that being said, when you talk about dual circulation as a strategy to sort of put more emphasis on domestic demand and, and domestic manufacturing capabilities, it sounds almost cliched or banal in the sense that every developed economy is, is looking to uh, drive domestic or drive economic growth, relying more on domestic forces and less on external, on external trade. But here's where I think there's something really interesting when you dig through the language of dual circulation as Beijing discusses it. Um, last uh, fall at the fifth plenary session of the CCP Central Committee, um, in their big readout, which is the same readout, I should say, where they where we have our only hints about what the final text of the 14th five-year plan is. Um, the, the fifth plenum readout discussed dual circulation uh, as being an important component for technological strength, as well as security and stability of supply chains. And, and I think those two components of technological strength and secure and stable supply chains are an absolutely crucial component, not only of dual circulation, but of what we'll see in the final text of the 14th five-year plan. Um, technological strength, what Xi Jinping means is robust domestic R&D ecosystem, um, high-tech manufacturing capabilities. And Beijing, I think, very much has the German model in mind here. Um, a national team of, uh, of technology firms that are world leaders, um, and a government planning and guidance apparatus that can help give uh, focus and resources um, to, to this effort. What does that mean about the role that uh, foreign companies are going to play in China or indeed that market forces are going to play in this new vision? This is not central planning. Um, but indeed, this is Xi Jinping's attempt, I think, to graph together uh, more government guidance or what my colleague Barry Naughton calls grand steerage essentially the government being there to essentially leverage financial channels to make sure the economic system is moving in the right direction. And, and this is because Beijing feels that the stakes are too high to allow market forces to allocate resources. From Beijing's perspective, the problem with the market allocation of resources is um, you, you, you don't know what widget will end up being produced in a market. Uh, Beijing is very clear about what types of widgets it wants produced in integrated circuits, uh, automated, you know, uh, um, uh, automated driving, uh, autonomous driving, um, semiconductors. It can't allow the vagaries of the market to, to control this. This really has to require um, government guidance. But it's critical that China has uh, um, it leverages markets to achieve some of these outcomes as per Beijing's thinking about this. So I don't think we should see this as central planning 2.0. We should see this as China's attempt to essentially leverage markets as mechanisms to, to channel resources in a relatively efficient manner to achieve predetermined outcomes as defined by these big meta planning documents like the 14th five year plan. Um, finally, it's important to remember that Beijing sees the size of its domestic market not only as a source of domestic productivity or sort of prosperity but critically as a geopolitical tool. Um, we see this again and again where Beijing is able to overcome external challenges or even concerns that uh, uh, countries have about China's behavior by essentially leveraging access to its market. It will continue that market access within this vision of dual circulation will continue to be an important tool that Beijing wields. And indeed at the Central Financial and Economic Affairs uh, Commission back in April last year, Xi Jinping talked about dual circulation as, as the ability to, quote, build a magnetic field for global resources, right? This is an attempt to bring in technology capital, not repel it. Again, this idea that we shouldn't think of this as self-sufficiency. We should think of this as I've called it elsewhere, sort of a, a hedged integration strategy. I know I've only got a minute left, so I just want to give a few thoughts on the on the five year plan. Then I will then I will be quiet. Um, despite what I've just said, which is very much um, discussing the five year plan and dual circulation as both a reaction to external geopolitical events and also about um, some of Xi Jinping's own personal concerns about China's ability to navigate the future, 
Um, the five-year plan is not about the U.S. And I think we need to remember that not everything Beijing does is a kind of a reflection of concerns it has over the geopolitical environment. A, a good data point here is their announcement of the, the broad outlines of the five-year plan occurred before the U.S. presidential election, days before. In other words, they weren't waiting to see if it was Trump two or Biden one. They were moving ahead with their strategy here irregardless. And that's because many of the concerns that you see manifested in the five-year plan are very domestic concerns. So, so we have to situate this technological self-sufficiency drive within what the five-year plan says about concerns over the environment, concerns over urbanization, concerns over agricultural security. So I think our, our analytical lens needs to be able to parse what is a reaction to geopolitical dynamics and what is just good old, as the, the former Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill said, all, all politics is local. All planning documents in China are local to some extent. They're about uh, addressing local domestic needs. Um, so um, I'm, I'm at 11 minutes, so I will uh, be respectful uh, and um, I, will, uh, I will summarily shut up. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Blanchard, to keeping to the time, strict time limit, and also to kind of putting into focus or the putting into the context of the China's dual circulation strategy and also at the last of your presentation, the 14th five-year plan in the context of kind of light of domestic and local needs as well as international context. I think it's a, it was a very good laying out of the context into which uh, one might look at these uh, plans. Uh, just uh, giving the, before giving the uh, floor to our second speaker, Mr. Tsugami, I'd like to remind the audience of how, on how they could submit uh, your questions. Uh, please, if anyone have, has questions to ask, please use the function of Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And please uh, do so uh, even while the second speaker is uh, speaking to save time uh, after these initial remarks will be over. So with that, and for the Japanese audience, uh, if you wish to do so, uh, you can submit your questions in Japanese. Uh, so with that remarks, I'd like uh, to ask Mr. Tsugami to take the, take the floor. The, Mr. Tsugami, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here today. Um, since time is limited, now I'd like to talk about two issues. One is my reading of China's fifth plenum proposal for the 14th five-year plan. The second is whether China's dream will really come true in future. Uh, first, uh, on the fifth plenum pro proposal, please turn to the, uh, yes, please. Um, the US policy toward China has experienced a fundamental transformation in past five years. The fifth plenum gave me an impression uh, that China's policy toward the United States has also undergone a fundamental transformation last year. In short, uh, China has given up the prospect of a turnaround of China-US relations, no matter who is the next president of the United States, and is ready uh, to launch a protracted struggle with the United States. Chinese diplomats sometimes wave olive branches toward the Biden administration, but to me, um, it is just a tactical gesture to buy time until uh, it can do without doing so. There are even, uh, there are different sayings in President Xi Jinping's words uh, at other uh, occasions, like in a Politburo meeting. And I think the gravity center of the CCP is there and not on the beautiful diplomatic language. Unwritten recognition underlying the fifth plenum is that decline of the United States and the rise of China. Xi Jinping administration thinks, first, the performance of the China and the United States in the battle against COVID-19 was more than contrasting. And the US political system is already dysfunctional due to division of people. These two facts prove 
that the CCP leadership and the Chinese regime was superior. And this is what they think, in my view. And this perception leads to an optimism so long as China would not give in and can continue protracted struggle with the United States, then time will tell in China's favor. But if you want to make, make it come true and surpass the United States, you need to develop economy further. I'll turn to the next page, next page, please. In order to drive economic growth, the first plenum put an unprecedented focus on innovation, science, and technology, and another focus on securing and upgrading supply chain. As the two charts on the right side of the slide show, China is already an R&D superpower. But after having faced with the US high-tech Cold War offensive, the resources that China will inject into R&D may be doubled from now in the next five-year plan. Please turn to the next page. This is a byproduct of Trump administration's high-tech Cold War policy. The after effect of the policy will come out in various forms as this slide shows. I share the US concern underlying high-tech Cold War policy, but you cannot kick on goal that hurts you and your allies' interest. I hope the Biden administration can make some policy adjustment here. Please turn to the next page. Maybe my illustration uh, is not too provocative and irritative and make us think that China doesn't play the game on a level playing field. China is so alien and different. So what is the ultimate cause? The ultimate cause is the fact that the wealth and power is highly concentrated to the government. It is so deep rooted and you cannot discipline such a regime with a trade agreement like TPP. State enterprise, subsidy, blah, blah, blah. They are just the derivatives of this regime. China has done an enormous amount of unwise spending that relies on debt. In an ordinary economy, it will soon face bubble burst, but in China, it doesn't happen thanks to the implicit government guarantees, IGG, provided by mighty government. But there is no miracle in the economy in the long run. Please turn to the next page. Behind the world's best economic performance last year uh, happened substantial deterioration of government finance and further worsening of excessive debt problem. Please turn to the next page. If China wants to maintain economic growth, uh, the prescription is very simple. Grow high efficient private, enter uh, private enter uh, enterprises and a new economy, while downsize and restructure old and wounded state-led economy. But the reality is opposite. Please turn to the next page. The most striking uh, feature of the Chinese economy is the extremely uneven distribution of wealth. Real estate price is unreasonably expensive and shareholding is extremely concentrated to very few shareholders. With this structure unchanged, I think it is very difficult for China to maintain economic growth, but it is difficult for CCP, particularly for left-minded Xi Jinping administration uh, to uh, do this reform because such a reform will directly hit the power base and vested interest, vested, vested interest structure of the CCP. Furthermore, things are getting even worse due to the implicit government guarantee practice. Please turn to the next page. Since two years ago, foreign investors' money put into Chinese domestic financial market has rapidly increased. 
The most important reason for this is that Chinese interest rate is exceptionally high in the world. It is because even zombie companies can easily refinance their debt thanks to the IGG. And as a result, demand for loan is quite strong and the interest rate would not decrease. Nowadays, not only China, but every major country faces excessive debt problems. Uh, so do ours or yours. But while most of the country's interest rate is close to zero, only China has a, that high interest rate. This further worsened the China's uneven distribution of wealth. Uh, please turn to the next page. Due to this, uh, uh, due to time constraint, I cannot get into details of this problem, but then with huge amount of non-performing loan undisposed and with interest rate kept quite high in every year, uh, in my uh, uh, calculations, two, three, three trillion renminbi of interest or other financial revenue is paid to creditors who are not entitled uh, to receive that. Two to three trillion renminbi is equal to two to three percent of GDP annually. In my view, this is an unjustifiable income transfer to one, state-owned financial institutions, and second, wealthy depositors. We may call this phenomenon a reverse financial repression. They say, state enterprise advance and the private enterprise retreat problem is serious. They also say growing disparity between the rich and poor is serious. But to me, implicit government guarantees is the common cause of these problems. And I'm not sure how much longer China can continue this way. My conclusion, in the coming several years, China will further close the gap with the United States. But to me, it is just temporary. In the long run, China cannot run away from the punishment for deviating from economic principles. I don't think China can maintain more than 4.5% of annual growth for uh, coming 15 years from now, uh, the next five-year plan forecast. Back to the level playing field issue. My answer is sooner or later, China will also, uh, also be subject to the level playing field rules. There is no miracle in the economy. The biggest fear of mine is if the United States loses patience and makes a bad move, hurting its our own, own interest and those of its allies. I'm not saying nothing need to be done. We must be united and some actions must be taken against China. But simultaneously, we also need to be patient and cool-headed. I stop here, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tsugami. Uh, following Mr. Blanchett, you also uh, shed the light on the more internal domestic situation in China, which, and also particularly from the economic point of view, which again, I think gives us uh, some food for thought in considering their plans. Uh, while two uh, discussants are making their initial presentations, we are already getting a number of questions and comments. So uh, I think uh, without further ado, I'd like to summarize these questions and ask these two speakers to respond. I think I'm getting two kinds of questions. One group is more focused on China and its kind of situation, its policies. And another is maybe maybe also could be answered by the speakers in the second session. Uh, some of the questions are already focusing on how Japan and the US should respond or how China's policy is influencing Japan's or US policy. So I would first pick up the first group of questions that I see here. 
First of all, first question, and I don't mention, sorry, the, the audience name because some of them are too complicated. Sorry for that. Uh, first question uh, asks uh, regarding the exploration of outer space. Uh, based on your presentation, uh, the, can, can one understand the exploration of outer space by China in the same context in the sense that they are uh, not relying on outside resources, but relying on themselves? That is one question. And another question regarding China itself uh, is whether the Trump administration's approach uh, slowed or accelerated the ability of China to develop its high-tech products and uh, high-end semiconductors. Another question regarding China itself is uh, whether, okay, it's, it, it may be, have been answered partly by Tsugami-san, but to particularly to Mr. Blanchett, whether you think the current Chinese policy uh, by President Xi could achieve the, his goal of achieving technological uh, sufficiency and the superiority, how to think about uh, surprises uh, in the future. Uh, that might be another question is whether they see the role and the prospects of the Belt and Road Initiative by China. I think, and another thing, uh, the, okay, we are getting more, but this is a fast group of questions. Second group of questions I see is more impacting or related to Japan or China. So what will be the level of cooperation of defense technology uh, industries between US, uh, sorry, US, US and Japanese uh, defense companies and how much increase uh, you would like to see? This is already probably getting into the second session. And also there is a question about how Chinese technology infiltration is happening into the Japanese education system and the market. Uh, and also second, probably related to second session, uh, Japan's relationship with the US, is it driven primarily by Chinese so-called threat or how will Japan's investment change? in countries like India and other countries. So I will first stop here because I'm getting more and more questions, but it's better to hear from you two speakers to uh, your thoughts about these two groups of questions. So Mr. Blanchett first. Well, thank you. Th those are uh, great questions. And yeah, I agree. I see there's there's kind of two, two buckets here of, um, and looking down at the end, I saw some new questions coming in, but essentially what has the Trump administration done um, over the past four years to slow or bend the curve um, of China's efforts? And then a really great question of, is this bet by Xi Jinping gonna work? Um, is this new model, this kind of state-driven or state-guided model that's attempting to achieve this, this kind of technological supremacy liftoff um, is this going to work? And again, the previous speaker just laid out a lot of the really powerful structural dynamics that China is going to have to overcome. You know, quick thoughts on both those questions. Um, you know, to Dimitri's question on, on you know, did Trump administration slow or accelerate um, the ability, and I'm going to focus on that word, the ability of China to develop. Um, it certainly, it's undoubtable that China is dealing with a source, a component sourcing headache now after four years of Trump administration, which it just wasn't dealing with in 2015. Um, and of course, a critical focus of the Trump administration was precisely to, through hook, through sanctioning, through addition to the 1237 list that DOD has put out, to executive orders, to strong arming and also working with uh, uh, partners and allies, essentially trying to cut off China's access to critical components, especially in the semiconductor and 5G space. Uh, I don't think it's, it's inarguable that that had a dampening effect. Um, and of course, many of the, the accelerating tactics, the, the, Xi, the Xi Jinping administration is now taking the real doubling down on this attempt to uh, boost indigenous capacities um, and drive self-sufficiency is, is, of course, a, a response to that. The bigger question, though, I think, is, is the use of the word, the ability. Um, Trump did nothing to increase China's ability to do any of this. 
what it did is it, it strengthened the resolve to do it. And China is still looking out at a global supply chain, especially in critical technologies. It's not liking what it's seeing. And that indeed has been behind some of the strategic stockpiling of components, not only from companies like Huawei, but from the you know, 48 million smaller semiconductor companies in China right now, part of this new wave of overcapacity, who have spent the better part of a year you know, also stockpiling components. That only works for a while. And of course, that doesn't put you out at the front, the, the, the R&D frontier, you know, where, where they would need to be. And of course, people who follow, especially the semiconductor space a lot closer than I do, can speak to the critical gaps, um, the lagging China has in, in this space, which, which, it's not, which it won't be uh, catching up anytime soon. So the resolve is there, the capital is there, the, the, the intensity is there, but this is still trying to essentially leapfrog by uh, tools that China has long used to essentially you know, goose a, a, an industry or, or a sector. Um, and that's great to get you scale. That's great to get you scale at a, at a rapid speed, but that is not great to catch up. Um, so I think that the, the, I think China still has a really, really formidable challenge um, on, on the ability to develop high, high tech semiconductors, you know, related. And finally, I don't want to sp speak too long, just related on, on a really good question right below that on, is this going to work? Um, I guess I have two comments on that. Um, by three, all of them unhelpful. Number one, we don't know. And I say this because I think we're really good as external observers of, of listing all of the weaknesses of China's system. And we've been doing that for four decades. Right, and I've predicted ten of the last zero economic collapses in China, um, because what I think we're not good at is looking at the the signs of or the elements of resiliency within China's system. Um, and so I don't mean to to negate concerns about the the headwinds that China is facing or the fragilities of its system, um, but I do mean to say probably some you know, humility on our part uh, on, on how long they can stretch this thing out. Second comment, I guess, I may, I'll just make two. Second comment is my gut tells me this is not a sustainable model for, for many of the reasons that the previous speaker laid out. In the end, what Xi Jinping is doing is just a smarter version of central planning. It's essentially saying, I wanna use more market forces, but we're gonna be throwing a ton of capital intentionally almost creating waves of overcapacity in high-tech spaces in the hopes that we, we hit the bullseye in a few critical you know, technologies. But, and this for me is the big but, um, I think this model still has some gas left in it. And even if I don't believe in the long-term sustainability of it, Japan, United States, our friends and allies in, in, in Europe and across the world, we're gonna be dealing with this system for, I don't know, the next decade. And so I think even if we see that there's some real weaknesses of the system, uh, U.S. and Japanese companies still have to compete against these domestic national champions and some of the big SOEs who have a lot of support behind them. And as we know, with overcapacity in other sectors, when China goes big on an industry, you're going to get a wave of overcapacity. It's going to drive down prices and it's going to push out more efficient competitors as we look at China really gear up with, under the 14 five-year plan to get into some of these kind of critical and emerging technologies, um, that's going to have a really depressing effect on, on uh, uh, capital expenditures, on rates of return, and on pricing for the international environment. So even if we think this is a weak model, we're going to have to be confronting this for, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. So um, uh, great questions, and I realize I didn't answer both of them, but those are just some, some thoughts. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Blanchett, for covering so many aspects. And I'd like to turn to Mr. Tsugami. And before turning, you, uh, I have another specific question addressed to you. Uh, if you could include in your answer, sorry for the last minute, uh, how you see the uh, effect of aging of the Chinese population to the economic growth. So, Mr. Tsugami, please. Thank you. First, I make a short comment on China's iron driven uh, policy. Um, I think the problem is that this policy will waste a huge amount of money again. Uh, for example, uh, uh, 
if you interest if you invest in an uh, 1000 uh, semiconductor chip companies maybe uh, the company that can eventually survive is only one or two companies uh, for the rest all is done all is dead uh, so that would be a very uh, big waste of money and uh, uh, from even from the macroeconomic view uh, uh, experts are uh, viewing that in the that investment for R and D, uh, the, the efficiency is continued to getting down. Uh, so uh, investment driven, uh, uh, R and D driven uh, policy of China will also see an, the, the decline in efficiency. And another problem is that uh, uh, it will deprive uh, enterprises uh, of um, vitality or innovative uh, move. Recently, uh, there were the big news articles on Alibaba or Mr. Jack Ma. Uh, I think uh, the company uh, was finally uh, um, uh, put under state control, party control. Uh, the C CCP thinks that uh, uh, platform companies should not be free. Uh, they, should, they must be under uh, party and the state control but this will deprive the company of their vitality. Uh, uh, so uh, I don't think uh, China's uh, platform companies, not only uh, Alibaba, but uh, also other uh, platform companies uh, will lose their vitalities in the long run. And on uh, Trump administration's uh, 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 harsh policy, uh, it was really a big blow uh, for companies like Huawei. Uh, they cannot make uh, manufacture uh, high-end uh, smartphones anymore uh, for the time being. Uh, but uh, we should not underestimate uh, their, uh, their Chinese ability to adjust themselves uh, to their environment. Uh, there is an, a, a a uh, concept of cloud mobile phone, which doesn't need high-end chip. With a very high-speed uh, 5G networks, uh, those are uh, uh, tasks which need uh, high-end chips. Uh, you can throw that task to run the servers and the smartphone can only, uh, they, need on they only need to the answers uh, of those tasks. With this cloud mobile phone uh, 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 becomes popular, then the high-end smartphones price would be less than uh, 200 US dollars. So the question is whether uh, Apple or Samsung can survive with that cheap uh, high-end smartphone. China really has such an adjustment ability. Yeah, we should not underestimate that. And uh, uh, finally, um, what we should do, I think uh, the biggest stress uh, should be put on accelerating our L&D uh, and, and not uh, on uh, policy that is quite against economic principle. I stop here, oh, so, so. <laughs> uh, demographic problem. I think uh, China has finally uh, come to understand uh, they cannot run away from the demographic future. Uh, they have already understood that, but there is another problem that they cannot un still understand fully. This is a uh, pension liability problems. Eight years ago, there was an, an economic analysis alarming that uh, uh, pension liability will be a uh, big problem in future. Uh, that was a very um, noteworthy and, uh, and, uh, warning, but that has a very big problems and, uh, from uh, 
if you look at look back from now, because the argue liability would become 80% of GDP in year 2050. But uh, the GDP uh, of 2050 it was estimated that um, not too high because they still uh, maintain 6% annual growth of GDP, even in 2015. If you look back from now, <laughs> it's a joke, but eight years ago, the world, everyone is uh, expecting, it was expectating uh, that China can continue that high growth. But if you downgrade uh, the future economic growth rate, then the pension liability, the size of the pension liability will soar. China has not um, fully understood uh, the magnitude of this problem. Um, so that will be an, another big blow to China's financial system or uh, fin government financial systems. I stop here, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for both of you uh, for answering so kind of uh, succinctly. We have still a couple of minutes left. So I'd like to go through the remaining questions that I see on the screen. I see many of them might be also well answered in the second session, uh, but some of them are more specifically about this session. Uh, first of all, uh, specific address to Mr. Blanchett, uh, how you see the increasing party control over the economic activities, would you see a kind of chilling effect of that? And uh, another question, maybe this is for the second session, but do you, both of you, uh, would you see the how to see, uh, would you see that Biden administration, new US administration, new US administration would continue the so-called decoupling strategy uh, regarding China? Uh, well, population growth, that was answered. And well, this may be for the second session, but another question is what is the current state of Japan's efforts to advance free flows of data with trust? And specifically to Mr. Tsugami, well, patience may be the right course of action for now, but uh, eventually a, risk, a repricing of credit risk within China will be necessary. Can the world afford to wait until then? Uh, then when will China's growth limits may become visible? And to Mr. Blanchett specifically, uh, well, that may be also the second session, but the how do you see uh, the China's chance of overcoming the obstacle of so-called West countries limiting their exports of the most advanced machineries, parts, and materials for the production of microprocessors. And last but not least, uh, which US allies, other than Japan, thank you for the question, uh, the, you, the most key, can, the, the most important country in this supply chain consideration. So I, I'm afraid I can give you only three minutes each to both of you. So Mr. Blanchett first. I will use my three minutes to address the question on the, the party and the, the economy, because it's the one I follow closest. Just two comments on this. This is a, a, a critically important development that we need to be paying more attention to. And there's, there's two elements here. One is just increasing party control over economic policy making and more political influence over what were traditionally um, more, more sort of technocratic management of the economy. So you're seeing much more um, de jure, in other words, legal party control over economic policy as the party gets more powerful vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the government. But actually, um, two kind of sub-comments here that I think are, are really important. One, um, the Communist Party is evolving or creating an entirely new conception of corporate governance, one where the party is a core component of, of oversight of economic entities. Um, this is new. There have always been party cells since the 1993 company law. If you have three or more party members, you need to have a party cell. That's old, but the party cell didn't really do anything for a very long, a very long time. And now since about 2015, there's an effort 
to, to have more, uh, uh, more corporate governance, um, um, the party play more of a role in corporate governance, and also you're seeing more concerns about party sales being coming more active. What this means, my kind of big takeaway is, um, because of these actions that the Communist Party is taking and, and imposing on Chinese companies, it's going to make it very hard for Chinese companies to be integrated globally. This is where a domestic political imperative that the party has to increase oversight is actually making it harder for the truly private companies in China to be out uh, uh, investing and, and buying technologies globally because Japan, the United States, Canada, Germany, we're, 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 we're skeptical of how truly independent a company can be when it has the Communist Party uh, in, on its, in its corporate governance. So um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much with your very uh, short and focused replies. So Mr. Tsugami, please. So um, I will use my three minutes on then China's credit risk. Um, IMF made an, a very uh, uh, an detailed uh, analysis on China's non-performing loans and some four, uh, five years ago. And it said um, uh, corporate loans uh, by uh, commercial banks, uh, 50 15% of those loans are at risk, but it does not include uh, loans to um, local government financial vehicle, uh, which is most problematic. I don't think uh, loans to an LGFB uh, will burst thanks to uh, investment, uh, implicit uh, government guarantee issue. Yeah, can practice, but um, their interest covered ratio is only uh, 0 0.4. And so from this point of view, it is most um, problematic uh, uh, in the sense that an unjustifiable uh, uh, wealth transfer is very, very big. So we cannot, um, uh, measure uh, China's credit risk from the point of uh, if the non-performing non loan will burst, uh, China's um, credit bubble will bust. I don't think it is unlikely to happen, at least in, in a decade. Uh, what is most problematic is an IGG, implicit in, in government guarantee, uh, will more and more deteriorate uh, China's economy. Um, so uh, that is my uh, short comment on credit risk. Uh, and uh, on party control, I agree with Mr. Branchett's notion. Um, I don't think this is a good idea. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, in a news article, it said that an, uh, Jack, Jack Ma's and uh, the remarks at an, an uh, seminar uh, angered uh, President Xi Jinping. And after having and heard of, of that news, local party, uh, which has a relationship with an, an Alibaba, uh, suddenly cut down the channels with, the, with those companies. Uh, party control. Uh, may bring about such an excessive an, an reactions uh, in the uh, cuddles. Uh, so I don't think it will not quite, it will not work uh, quite well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tsugami. Uh, there is one question that I couldn't, uh, they are still coming. So I think we cannot cover all of them. Uh, so. What I would like to do is just to mention these questions. And if uh, any of you could respond in one minute, I will do so. If so, I think it did have to be left for the second session. Uh, first question that I missed or that I couldn't address was how would you characterize China's ability to exert influence uh, on the international standard setting, uh, for example, regarding 5G? I think Mr. Tsugami already mentioned from the competitiveness point of view, but the standard setting point of view. And uh, well, uh, this is probably different question. Uh, 
Tokyo to go forward with Olympics, uh, where, where it may not be quite related to high tech issues, uh, but China will surely go forward with winter 2022. Well, that's a bit different question. To Mr. Tsugami, uh, do you think the Chinese government is taking any tentative steps to moderate its implicit guarantee of government support for state-backed companies? So if any of you wish to answer in one minute, uh, I'd like to give the floor just briefly to Mr. Blanchett and to Mr. Tsugami, and we have to wrap up. Mr. Blanchett, if you may also probably the standard setting question. Yeah, I, I think um, that probably uh, I'll yield my time just because I don't have a, a, a great answer, certainly not one that I could get in in a minute. So I'll, I'll, I'll yield the floor. Right. Uh, Mr. Tsugami, would you like to add uh, anything in response to these questions? Uh, the question and then and say that the moderate uh, the, the function of an uh, uh, implicit government guarantee. Uh, I take that as an um, de decrease uh, the function of such an uh, I IGG. Um, I don't think that is the case today. Um, uh, and the situation is becoming worse. Uh, that is my view. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very short and clear cut answer. I think we have to wrap up this session. And thank you. first of all, I'd like to thank two fantastic discussants who really made their own, not only kind of in their initial uh, presentations, but covered quite a wide range of questions in such a short time, in such a uh, uh, succinct manner. I don't want. I don't try to wrap up in any substantive way. Uh, I think we can just say that we've got great insight into not only China's policy and the strategy, but their political, economic, social circumstances, which led to these policies. Which I and I, I believe and I hope the all the audience agree that laid a quite excellent ground to proceed to the session two, which would be uh, moderated by Matthew. So Matthew, I'm going to hand over the floor to you. Thank you again for uh, Mr. Blanchett and Mr. Tsugami. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ichikawa-san. And, and uh, also thank you, Jude and uh, Tsugami-san. Really excellent uh, conversation and, and obviously far too much ground to cover in just a short hour, but um, but I commend to you both of their independent work. Um, if I can't say, and it's a little bit um, forward Tsugami-san, but if you're still listening, um, one of the questioners asked if, if we could circulate your slides and if it's okay, um, and if it's possible technologically, if Megan could perhaps put those slides into the chat or wherever um, our, um, colleagues can reach them. If, if that's not going to work, then please follow up with either JIA or, or us at CSIS and we'll get them to you if, you if you'd like his slides. Okay, thank you so much Ichikawa-san. Thank you um, again. Uh, we have a bunch of questions left over. I've taken note of as many of them as I could, ones that we, um, we can maybe try to take a stab at. But in this panel, we're going to talk about some of the same issues, the challenge itself from China and more broadly in technology high technology supply chains, um, and look at how the US and Japan uh, see those problems, how they are addressing them, how they can address them uh, together, where there may be constraints on that kind of cooperation. And we have a terrific pair of uh, uh, panelists again uh, to do that. Uh, first of all, Anya Manuel, um, who is co-founder and principal at Rice Hadley Gates and Manuel LLC. Um, and she is also a research affiliate at Stanford University. She's written widely on foreign policy and technology issues, um, including two articles worth mentioning here. One, a widely read piece in Foreign Affairs magazine last summer um, on China's civil military fusion strategy, which was co-written with my former CSIS colleague and now Deputy Secretary of Defense, Kathleen Hicks. So I had to mention that one, uh, but it's a, it's a very important, uh, significant article as well. Uh, I, I commend that to you. And also she wrote an op-ed last fall in the Financial Times that I paid particular interest in because I'm interested in global governance and organizations. And she suggested uh, the idea of a technology 10, um, a T10, uh, to bring together countries, um, allies uh, to work on these technology issues. So 
I commend both of those pieces to you. Anya is in San Francisco, uh, joining us uh, this afternoon, I guess her time. Um, and then our other uh, panelist is Kazuto Suzuki, who is professor of international politics at the University of Tokyo. He is an expert on space policy, among other things. He contributed to the drafting of the basic space law of Japan, but he also follows export controls, nonproliferation, and other issues. Um, he wrote a lengthy piece, uh, or co-wrote a lengthy report um, uh, uh, with the RAND Corporation in 2017 on how the US and Japan can work together to deter gray zone coercion in the maritime, cyber, and space domain. So that's also very relevant to this conversation. So I've asked each uh, speaker to spend you know, eight to 10 minutes talking about how they see the problem and the solutions and how the US and Japan can work together in these areas. So with no further ado, Anya, please. Thank you, Matt. That was a very kind introduction. And Suzuki-san, thank you for joining us. I've been wanting to meet you and now we get a chance to do it on this panel. So Matt, you asked us to outline, what's the problem? How significant is it for the US and Japan? What should we as the US do about it? And then what can the US and Japan do to together. So I'll give that a start in seven minutes, and then we can discuss it more in the questions. Across history, countries with the best technology tend to be the most powerful. And the US and Japan, along with South Korea, Germany, and others have had the advantage of being in the technological lead for several decades now. China hasn't quite caught up with us, but it's rapidly getting there. And as you would say in the US, when you look in your rear view mirror in the, in the car, you know, objects are closer than they appear. <laughs> so let me just go into what I see the problem set. I don't think it's all technology. We certainly don't wanna keep China down. We want their economy to grow. We want them to be a, a steady, um, have, a, have a steady economic system. And China is a truly impressive innovation superpower. So I would just list five or six areas where I think the US, Japan, and our friends and allies should be looking at what China is doing and should ensure that we stay in the lead. One is financial technologies. We don't talk about these very much, especially not in the US, but this could be the next 5G. If you look at Alipay and financial, WeChat Pay, I heard in the last panel, you know, the Chinese are doing the best to hobble their own amazing companies in this space, but they are really out ahead. You know, the Chinese uh, central bank is now looking at a digital yuan. And in the US at least, we're regulating a lot of our most advanced FinTech companies out of, out of town, so to speak. So that's one, FinTech. 5G has been discussed a lot. 6G is coming right down the line. Huawei, of course, is excellent, neck and neck, I would say, technologically with Ericsson and Nokia, and of course, heavily subsidized, and so in a lot of ways, cheaper. We don't need to talk more about that. Third, artificial intelligence. Some of the best academics in this space are, of course, in the United States, uh, Japan, Canada, the UK, but the tinkering and the application of AI increasingly is happening in, in China. And when you, I've been to a lot of the different AI labs there in sort of China's Silicon Valley outside of Beijing, they're really impressive and straight out of central casting. And those are some really impressive entrepreneurs. So I would put artificial intelligence, especially certain pieces of it as, as in some areas, China really being neck and neck, that's three. Fourth is semiconductors, which of course are the building blocks to everything else. If you're gonna be world leading in, in AI and quantum and the chips are key and no one knows that better than Japan <laughs> because you are still in the lead along with Korea, Taiwan and in design um, and also in the sale of manufacturing equipment, the US. So of course in semiconductors, China hasn't quite caught up but it's spending billions and billions and billions of dollars trying to get there. And the final one I would mention is quantum. That's a little farther out. So of course it's a little harder to tell, but certainly the Chinese are emphasizing it. So if you look across those six um, areas of technology, how do we ensure that the Japan, the US, our friends in Europe continue to be leading in innovation in those areas? 
I would give the Trump administration credit for recognizing the issue. They realized that there was a concern and they started doing something about it. But so far, I would say it's almost entirely been defensive. How do you build a moat around American technology? Um, you know, stricter export controls, Chinese companies can't invest in American tech companies, American tech companies can't export a lot of things to China. It was a start and certainly some of that was necessary. A few things I would say were overreach, but now it's time to do the second piece, which is harder, but also more important. So what do we do now? We have an opportunity instead of tearing China down to build ourselves up. And in the US, um, I've given talks and written about this and I'll, I'll get to what we can do with Japan. But in the US, the first thing we need to do is coordinate our tech and innovation policy better across the US government. Jake Sullivan and our friends who are going into the Biden administration now have made a start. They created a small office within the National Security Council that's gonna do some of that work. They've um, increased the visibility of our Office of Science and Technology Policy. Those are good steps, but boy, a lot more is needed, right? We're gonna really have to push this. We need to start working with our allies, especially Japan. And I'll come back to this, Matt, you, you very nicely mentioned my article. I'll just come back to that in a minute. Uh, we will need to think through how to protect basic research at our universities. The Trump administration took a very tough line. And when you hear some people in Congress talk, it goes down to, well, we don't want Chinese researchers and students. I think that's not the answer. On the other hand, we have been a little bit naive, so we've got to think through how do we do that? Also something probably to do with Japan and others. Um, in the US in particular, much more than for you in Tokyo, we have to increase federal government research and development funding. It's gone down year after year. It's now about 0.7% of GDP. At the height of the Cold War, it was 2%. So even if we don't go all the way back there, there's definitely a little heft is needed. And we need to do a lot in the US to elevate science and technology education. We can't even fill our science and tech PhD programs with Americans, even if we wanted to. So it's time to get that pipeline up and moving. Now for the most important part and why we're all here and why Matt and others are up late in Washington <laughs> and our friends from Tokyo are joining us, what can the US and Japan do together? And I'll just give you some ideas and we can expand on them in the questioning. I know that Japan shares some of the concerns about national security and the competitive threat from China, but of course you don't wanna be shut out of that market. We feel it. I live here in Silicon Valley. Our companies say the same things. They say, well, our biggest market is in China. If we can't sell to them, we remain, we're uncompetitive. We can't fund the R&D, makes a lot of sense. So let me outline a couple of areas where I believe the Japan and the US can be the core of what I would call a tech alliance or tech 10 to come together and then bring in other friends depending on the topic. And I would keep it very flexible. But here's the most important one I would say is semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Um, these are the things that build the fabs that make the world's most advanced chips. A lot of them, I think over 50% are built here in the US, something like 30% of the market comes from Japan. Korea, the Netherlands, um, there, that has been export controlled by the Trump administration where they've said basically you can't export this equipment. I would propose that you have a joint standard where you say, for example, of course these companies need to sell to China. It's the biggest market. But maybe we can make an agreement to sell only less than the most advanced technology, above 40 nanometers, whatever it is, and that we agree it jointly. So it's not just the US saying, well, this is export control and then Japan or Korea step in and sell the stuff that Americans aren't allowed to. So semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, the open RAN network, I don't wanna get too technical here, we can do it later, but it's essentially a way to disintermediate Huawei, also Ericsson and Nokia from controlling all of the 5G system and putting a software layer on top. Japan, of course, with Rakuten is in the lead. There's been a lot of pickup, um, especially the Europeans are now talking about it. So there's movement there. And I think the US and Japan can 
jointly proselytize and make sure that the rest of the world is, is starting to look at this as a real alternative in the 5G space. In artificial intelligence, I already said previously, the most advanced researchers are in Japan, the United States, also in Canada and the UK. What can we do together to create the ethics guidelines that we're then gonna push out to the rest of the world? Uh, the US military has worked on some that came out. I know Japan is independently doing it. There's more we can do together. And finally, I talked about our um, basic research in the US, and by this I mean the stuff that happens at universities like Stanford, University of Tokyo, um, advanced physics research, chemistry research, not the stuff that's classified and should be in a government lab. We need common sense standards that are universal with our friends, not just in the United States, and there's a lot we can do together there. And I'll raise one final issue, and then I'll um, yield my time. The, in the previous panel, there was a question on international standard setting. It's a real issue. I mean, the way this used to work is, may the best company, no matter where it's from, put forward the standard, and then there was a quiet vote on whichever one we should go with. And it worked pretty well. I'm simplifying a lot. But the Chinese have recently really pushed themselves into the standard setting bodies and behind the scenes essentially tell their companies how to vote. And not surprisingly, they should usually vote, vote for the Chinese standard, <laughs> often the Huawei one. And we shouldn't go over to the Chinese way of doing things. I would not want the US or the Japanese government meddling too much in international standard setting. But there's certainly more we can do to get our own companies aware of what's happening and in some appropriate ways working together. I'll leave it there. Thanks. Excellent. Really terrific. And just a tour de force there and a lot of issues um, to follow up on. On that very last one, I was going to raise that because I think that's a really important issue where the U.S. has had this sort of bottom up private sector approach to standard setting. It's worked pretty well, but we've sort of lost our edge. And meanwhile, China, Europe and others are coming in sort of top down and, and really dominating a lot of those conversations and feels like an area where the US and Japan really ought to be working. But you mentioned a lot of other things that are very important and we should follow up on um, if we have time. Um, but let me get uh, Suzuki Sensei into the conversation. So why don't you go ahead, Suzuki-san, and then we'll, um, we'll add uh, the other questions. Go ahead. Well, um, thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, well, I'm so sorry, Suzuki-san. I'm sorry to interrupt. I should have said at the very beginning, I, I apologize. For people listening, if you um, want to ask additional questions, please use the Q&A function. We're still able to take questions, although we have plenty to cover. We're well, we welcome additional questions. Also, Tsugami-san's slides will be on the CSIS event page um, in a PDF form. So you'll be able to get those if you want those later. Sorry, go ahead, Suzuki-san. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew, and uh, thank you very much, Anya. Um, I, I, the the word is uh, Anya's word is mine. Um, I I wanted to meet you, and uh, I wanted to have this uh, panel. So it's a, it's an excellent opportunity. So I'm a political scientist, so I'm not going into a in detail of the tech, technical issues. But um, what I like to mention in this uh, very short presentation is that. There are two things that we need to be aware of. Uh, one, one is the, the question of dependency. Are we depending the Chinese technology per se, or are we depending on the Chinese market? And I think this is a, a very uh, uh, the important issue uh, with regard to the second uh, point, which is the division of labor of the technological development. For example, in the semiconductor, the uh, the uh, design and R and D are done in the, in the uh, United States, Japan, and Europe. Um, as uh, Anya mentioned, that the, the, there are um, the high end uh, technology are still in Japan and you uh, in the United States, but the problem is that most of the productions are out of these countries in Taiwan, in South Korea, and in, in China. So this division of uh, labor should, not, uh, should be uh, uh, mentioned when we talk about technology, um, a technological issue. And also we need to think about the dependency on this division of labor. 
and in the Chinese market. And one of the problem of the discussion of the um, technical issues or the you know high tech supply chain is that we have focus too much on the R&D design and all this uh, uh, you know, innovative side. But I think it is also very important to, to, to consider the importance of the industrial basis and industrial competitiveness and supply chain. I think uh, this, uh, Tsugami-san has mentioned this, and I think uh, this, the, the whole setting is of this uh, workshop is is excellently titled uh, about the supply chain and R and D. Um, I think uh, uh, we also need to be aware of China has more uh, uh, additional power to control the uh, over the uh, because of its size of the market. I think that uh, Jude had mentioned this. The uh, the the size of market itself has the power to impose the certain restriction. Um, the effect of the United States sanctions, unilateral sanctions over Iran, over uh, uh, Sudan and, and, and uh, North Korea is to some extent ex uh, effective. It's because the, the, the third countries like Japan Needs to choose either the market of Iran or market of United States, and uh, the market size can be used as the international power. So this is again another uh, important element that the, the China is using its uh, this uh, global um, supply chain network and using it as the as the leverage to move other countries. So one of the issues, we focus pretty much on, uh, when we talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, we focus very much on the investment from China. But also I think we need to be aware that the many countries depend on Chinese market as the destination of export, and also uh, they depend China as the uh, source of imports. And when uh, China imposing the control over the import, uh, over the trade uh, that has been uh, that is the problem and on top of that there are the i i, I think um, uh, jude had mentioned about the ccp uh, central economic committee in april uh, last year the xi jinping said that to develop the killer technology to make other countries depend on china and this is the, uh, a clear statement of using uh, these uh, technological capabilities to leverage, uh, to use as a leverage against other country. And, uh, and I think the China is starting to be aware of the power that having those uh, global supply chain network and the uh, key technologies which are in advance to other country so that they they are the sole provider of the uh, of the particular technology and and uh, that are the the points that anya mentioned about the uh, uh fintech uh, ai uh, quantum technology these are the areas where the china will uh, use as the force uh, uh, as a national state power to, to impose on the other countries. So what uh, can we do about it? Uh, one of the point is to reduce redundancy. We have to review the, I, I think yesterday there was a, 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 a Jen Psaki, the, the White House uh, press briefing, um, mentioned about the review of the semiconductor supply chain. And that is the, that is the important step towards the reducing the dependency on the production cycle of the, uh, of the semiconductor. And I think the problem is that those production process is manufacturing process is the low value, added value uh, domain. So we need to have much wider alliance, not only between Japan and the United States, but also involving countries like Vietnam, Thailand, and to include those countries as an alternative to the manufacturing site for Chinese uh, 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 
Chinese production capabilities and try to, uh, let's say, uh, create the economic uh, sphere to, uh, to, to secure the supply chain. And I think TPP is a very much uh, of the importance in, in, in this uh, objective. So the diversification of uh, production is one thing. And also we need to e expand our, our market size uh, through these uh, 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 TPP and the free, uh, free trade agreement. And one of the key player, not only about the market size, but also about the IT technology is India. And how to involve India into this framework is going to be a uh, uh, very important. And I think the framework of Quad, the Japan, United States, Australia, and India will have certain uh, uh, entry point of including the uh, India as the part of this wider scale um, uh, market to compete with the Chinese uh, uh, as an alternative to the Chinese market. The the other issue is the uh, R and D, of course. The I think that Anya mentioned that uh, we need to have an alliance of the uh, R and D, the development of the intellectual properties, and we need to um, and also the standard setting. I think the standard is extremely important, but I think the, the those who are holding and setting the standard are those who have technologies, uh, the first-hand technologies. So R&D in the high end, R&D in the, in the uh, higher value-added uh, domain is important. China uh, tend to be more uh, standard taper. Uh, they, are, they, are they are setting up the production site based on the, t the standard which are set by the uh, countries like United States, Japan, and Europe. So uh, I think we need to keep that and make sure that the United, uh, the China depends on those um, uh, ideas and new technologies, uh, patents of the uh, alliance, uh, the technological alliance T10. Uh, I, I like the idea of T10 uh, the, uh, with Japan, United States, uh, and Europe. Finally, I like to make the. Uh, <laughs> comments on what uh, Japan and United should do. I think, uh, uh, I, I think Anya mentioned uh, to some extent that there is a, a gap between the government policies and the business interests. And there are lots of uh, uh, Japanese industry which are pushing uh, and having a strong pressure uh, who has the very significant stake in China. And it is, uh, it is, getting much difficult for Japanese government to take the um, take the uh, tougher measures against China. So what we need to do is to have the dialogue uh, between uh, both uh, government and the industry uh, together to set up the, the sort of a coherent strategy between Japan and the United States, the government and the private industry to make sure that we are on the same page and try to to set up, you know, where we are going to. And I think uh, the uh, both government and uh, and the industry needs to work together on expanding the alternative market other than China. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Um, just so much ground to cover, and I'm going to try my best. It's really hard, and I apologize in advance to some of the questioners. I'm going to try and cluster questions and also uh, ask, <laughs> interweave a few of my own. So to Anya, a sort of cluster of questions around how the U.S. and let's say the Biden administration you know, can and should address some of these issues. So there's a sort of a cluster of questions um, everything from, you know, how is Jake Sullivan possibly going to manage this since he's got so much on his plate and how is all this going to be coordinated to um, how would you, so let me ask one domestic and one international. Domestically, what, what, um, what's the right, so you've talked about the basic investments we need to make in innovation, you know, R&D, get that spending up, uh, STEM education and so forth. But on the more targeted side, 
what used to be called industrial policy. I don't want to get into that debate, but let's say a more targeted effort. You've talked about in your article on civ, um, military um, fusion, you talked about collaborative disruption. So talk to us about sort of how, what exactly the government should be doing to try and help business. And a related back side of that question is, since you're sitting out there in the Bay Area, tell us a little more about the Silicon Valley perspective on these issues we've been discussing. And it sort of gets to Suzuki-san's point about government and business. There's quite a lot of tension between the two sides now on a range of issues. But, you know, how does gov- how do government and, and the private sector work together on this domestic agenda? And then internationally, I'm going to just take a piece of the T10, which, by the way, somebody asked what that is. It's basically the G7 plus Australia, South Korea, and India. But as you said, Anya, with flexibility to bring the Dutch in or others, depending on what the specific technologies are. But the Europe part of this is interesting. And someone has asked a question about this. You know, it seems like we can get Japan aligned with the U.S. fairly easily. But from a Washington perspective, Europe is a real challenge. The Biden folks seem to want to have a real impulse to pull out uh, to, to repair that relationship um, across the board. But in this particular set of issues, the uh, the Europeans have declared sort of technological sovereignty as their goal and broader strategic autonomy. They kind of want to develop their own capabilities and go their own way, they say. Um, and, you know, there are other issues philosophically between us. So it seems like we have to, the U.S. and Japan, pull Europe into this conversation more actively. So how would you, if you were advising Jake, how would you deal with all of that? That's sort of a cluster of questions for you, which is way too much to answer in a few minutes, but please try. <laughs> that shows you, you know, how sorry we feel for all the folks who are in government now, because it is just headache inducing. It's very complex. So let me start with U.S. government coordination, then I'll move to Europe and your other questions. So um, our U.S. government and many other governments, especially European ones, aren't very well set up for this. There's no IT ministry in the US government. So for our Japanese friends, the way this works in the US is you have essentially undersecretaries. So it's a very high level, so just under a deputy secretary in the key departments that manage pieces of our technology and innovation agenda, right? It's the research under secretary job at DOD, right? It's um, the head of the Bureau of of Industry and Security and ITA at Commerce. It's the economic portfolio at State. It's the person for international affairs at Treasury, but they all see different parts of it. And there's no one who's been able, what you really need someone is to, in the USA, we to herd the cats, <laughs> to get people on the same page and moving in the same direction. So that's what I think Jake is trying to do with this start within the NSC. It, it's going to be hard, I'm telling you, even if you have someone with so much clout, these people don't like to be coordinated. And so that's a, that's a very complex job. You asked how much industrial policy should we have? I would say very little and reflecting back what Jude said in the last session, boy, we don't wanna go to the Chinese model. There's no reason to out China, China. Sorry, Japan and the US and our friends are doing fine on our own with a little boost and a few exceptions. So I'll say this, Um, there's a huge amount of private sector R&D spending in the United States. A lot of it is by some of the big brand name tech companies that you know, you know, Google, Microsoft, others on AI. A lot of R&D spending that gets tax credits isn't on what I would call hard tech problems. Like it's not necessarily on new semiconductor manufacturing equipment, new chips, you know, those, those things that are really enormously expensive to design and then to produce. A lot of what counts for R&D spending is you know, your latest app or an emoji, or I think you can get an R&D tax credits for new craft beer in the United States. You know, we're all for craft beer, but maybe a little industrial policy there is warranted in the sense that you could give a few more carrots to industries that we really want to make sure we remain in the lead on, like semiconductors, um, with 
thoughtful restrictions that don't put them out of business, but say, okay, maybe you shouldn't be selling your most advanced technology to China. So I have a very, I would have a very subtle, thoughtful, nuanced approach for industrial policy. And that is not something the US government is very good at. So that's on the US. You then asked about Europe and, and let me just back up and, and describe what I mean when I have written about the tech 10. Others have to Mike Brown at DIUX and Richard Fontaine, I think had a piece and they're all slightly different. The, the general idea is, boy, we can't be doing this alone, just US versus China. We need to bring our friends along. After that agreement halts. <laughs> so my view is that it's not a new OECD. It's not a new international organization. Those are tend to be good at putting out pronouncements and not actually getting the work done. Um, and it's not one set of countries always involved. You know, I, I keep coming back to semiconductors, but there's a certain group of people that needs to be involved when you're talking about semiconductor manufacturing equipment, right? I mentioned them, Japan, Korea, US, Netherlands. There's a whole nother group of countries that needs to be involved when you're talking about AI, Canada, the UK, India, right? <laughs> Suzuki-san mentioned India. So my view would be you have working groups on the problem you're dealing with that brings to the table the CEOs of the right companies and the right governments for that particular issue. And that brings me to your final question, which I think was about Europe. You're right that Europe is hard to bring along. I'm, I'm part of, as I'm sure are you, various study groups about with Americans and Europeans, how can we better coordinate policy on China? And how can we better coordinate tech policy? And I'll just tell you, even though it was you know, not for attribution, in the first session we had, the Europeans launched immediately into, well, we, you have to tax the tech firms better <laughs> and you need French content. And that's not what we're talking about when we're Americans, we're talking about, you know, how do we get some of these national security issues right? So you're absolutely right, we've got a long way to go. Sorry, I was away from my mute button there. Um, um, okay, um, I can you just uh, can I just um, ask you to say a little more about the um, Silicon Valley perspective on the, this and the uh, you know how they sort of because as you said in passing in your in your opening remarks you know they're very dependent on the Chinese market, um, but on the other hand they've got to have some of the concerns that that are underlying this conversation about you know, resilience of supply chain, security of supply chains and so forth. So what's the, it's hard to oversimplify, to generalize, but what, what's the kind of general take on, on what the answer is here? Yeah, to, to parse it a little bit, um, you're moving from an attitude of just leave us alone, we've got this, let us do what we want to, oh, we see the problem. Let's work more with the US government to figure it out slowly but surely. And Silicon Valley isn't unified, right? It depends very much on which specific piece of the tech industry you're talking about. If you're the big internet companies, you're not in China anyway, right? You're just not. Um, Google, I don't know, Facebook does, Microsoft, a couple of the others have big AI, research labs, R&D in China. And the question is, do you shut that down? I don't know, probably not the right thing to do. No one's really talking about it in any coherent way. I think we've moved off a lot from three years ago when Google refused to participate in Project Maven, refused to cooperate with the US government on a pretty basic visual recognition AI project. I, I hear more and more people in the Valley saying, oh, how do we cooperate? with our government, that's that's a positive thing, but it's by no means universal. So I would say it's different depending on the specific industry you're in and we're moving in the right direction. Okay, terrific. Um, I'm gonna come back to you on a couple of other things, but um, let me get Suzuki Sensei into this conversation by asking um, 
you, um, Suzuki-san, about, uh, well, I want to give you a chance to elaborate a little on space cooperation. I'm particularly interested in that topic, and you've done a lot of work on that. So if you can give us one minute version of your kind of view of space cooperation. But the actual question I want to, I'm going to ask you two questions. One, um, you talked about getting production more diversified and, you know, frankly, out of China on some level. Japan has a subsidy program to encourage companies to take production, you know, back to Japan or into other Asian markets. Um, talk to us a little bit about how it's not a huge program, but it seems to have been quite popular with a lot of at least smaller companies. But is it uh, is it meaningful answer to all of this? And, and um, Anya, well, hearing him answer that, I'm interested in what you think about similar proposals that the Biden administration is thinking about to encourage reshoring of, of production, whether that's a good idea. But Suzuki-sensei first on that. Um, and then the, the final question for you, Suzuki-san, is about constraints on cooperation. J Japan doesn't have a security clearance um, it has a limited security clearance um, program that may constrain particularly business government collaboration, uh, maybe other aspects of cooperation. It may be one of the reasons that Japan isn't yet in the five eyes. I mean, I, I am interested in your view on whether that's a real constraint. And then the whole culture of defense and universities and business all working together on these issues seems to be still kind of underdeveloped in Japan. Can you talk to that? A lot of, lot of individual pieces there, but if you could take a stab at some of that, I appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, all those uh, points need to have another 10, 15 minutes to, to do the presentation. Um, the, the subsidy program for the diversification, yes, I think it is a very unique approach, but uh, there are there are certain legal, particularly, you know, um, uh, with regard to the WTO rules, etc. Uh, the METI started uh, in a sort of a very stealthy way to to sneak in this program, and but it became very popular for the small and medium sized companies, and they are. There are lots of uh, non-high-tech uh, industry which is uh, granted. Um, so there is no limit on which industry is uh, is subject to this uh, subsidy. So um, it's not really intended to to produce the result as as uh, as diversification of the high-tech industry. But there are some um, electronic uh, and the aviation and material industry using these subsidies to, to diversify their production site from China to uh, Southeast Asia. So there are, there are potential, and I think that this is, uh, this is uh, uh, useful, but I think we need to be careful uh, to, to, to walk on the fine line between this, uh, um, the government procurement, the, sub, the state, uh, state aid uh, 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 regulations on, on the WTO. The constraints on the business, uh, the information, the security, and the sensitive technology, yes, that's, that has been a big problem. Uh, one, we are, we are in discuss, this, we are discussing now about the, uh, 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 information clearance, the security clearance, but, uh, the, the, there is no basis of the legal legal basis as well as the, there is a lot of political um, uh, questions about uh, the setting up this uh, security clar uh, clarification and that I, I do agree that this is going to be the one of the problem of the constraints to to have the sort of a detailed collaboration on the R&D and, uh, and the technological cooperation collaborative projects. But in terms of policy, I think it is not that heavily problematic. I think we are, we are able to, to discuss about the strategic goals. We are able to discuss about, you know, uh, 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 sort of a directions that which, which directions we need, we need to talk to, uh, we need, we need to, to subject to and, and, and try to understand well, to try to to at least uh, understand each other on, on where we're going to. The defense and university issue has been a big problem, and uh, uh, the the um, uh, the uh, uh, there are, there has been a, the historical problem, and I think you are well aware 
of that. Um, I think the uh, uh, Japanese still have a very strong understanding of the separation between the military technology and the civilian technology. And the funding issue has been also a very uh, big problem so that the funds are diverse, uh, separated into the military and the civilian uh, programs. So that has been the problem. Finally, on space, Japan and the United States is very good in uh, space collaboration and I think uh, we are in, in, in a good partnership for, for make sure that you know, we will be staying ahead of the Chinese approaches on the, ma the human space flight and, uh, and uh, exploration on the moon. So uh, I think the idea of the Artemis program is, uh, is, is the, the name of the game. Uh, and I think we are, we are happy about it. Great. Okay. Well, I know you have a lot more to offer on that subject and you've written on it as well. So I commend your work on that to people um, listening. Um, okay. Anya, let me come back and ask you about that subsidy program and the sort of ideas that the, the Biden administration's had for buying America and linking that to some of these technological investments and so forth. Um, is that a good idea? Is that going to work? Um, and and then a related question, which a questioner in the first group asked, which we haven't kind of directly answered is, you know, is the Biden administration going to sort of continue the, the decoupling strategy um, of the Trump administration? Um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and I guess I add a tail to that one as well, which is if they do provide, produce, um, pursue it even selectively, um, and maybe throw in as well, take other tough positions on China, um, like on human rights and so forth. Is there a risk that that's going to get in the way of some of the U.S.-Japan cooperation and they're going to be, you know, particularly Japanese companies could get caught in the crossfire of sanctions or decoupling efforts or other attempts to um, address the China problem? Is that something that's sort of a factor here again? And we need an hour for each of those sub questions, but do your best. <laughs> we can all stay here all day. Exactly. First of all, I want to thank Suzuki san for doing this all in English. I certainly couldn't do it in Japanese. So that's very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Especially these heavy technical things. Um, let me take them one at a time. Subsidies for reshoring. Boy, I would be very careful and do them only in very precise and narrow circumstances. For example, do you want one or two semiconductor fabs, factories, that are in the United States that supply the US military? Maybe, I think that's something you could talk about. But a broad, you know, a huge subsidy program, you know, these things are hugely expensive. One fab can cost $10 billion or more, right? So um, there's the US CHIPS Act out there, which proposes $23 billion in subsidies. That seems like nothing now that we're se selling, you know, now that we're putting out a $1.9 trillion package, but ultimately these things become very expensive and you're picking winners and losers. So I'm, I would stay away from it as much as possible. Buy American, you know, of course, we live in a populist age, both on the on the left and on the right. Uh, of course, we need to strengthen our manufacturing base, including in high tech manufacturing. Can you buy American in all instances? Probably not. I know that's an unpopular position now, so I would be careful about that too. And I would tread lightly on all of these things that are market distorting, right? Because in fact, they are. On the tech decoupling, uh, the poor Biden administration has a bewildering array of executive orders to sort out. I think we have, at our firm were keeping track of them and we stopped. There are just dozens and dozens of individually small, but in, in combined very large effect on US technology cooperation with China and it's basically ended, right? So. They're taking it slowly, deliberately as they should, and they're doing currently a review of all of those executive orders and some of them will be rationalized. And I think that's the only way to proceed. And you had one more question, I can't remember. Uh, 
I can't either. Uh, <laughs> sorry, we'll come back to it. I, I have one more for you. If 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 um, if I can just get Suzuki San in um, on another question from the audience, which is um, oh, by the way. Um, Dimitri Sevastopoulou asked a really interesting question about fintech, but I'm because he's a reporter and he can find you separately. I'm going to let Dimitri track you down and say, I'm um, sorry, Dimitri, but but uh, but you can talk to Anya directly. It's a really interesting topic and one that we're also very interested in in my program at CSIS. But um, uh, Suzuki-san, interesting you know, question. You mentioned Taiwan and um, the importance of it in this whole story. And by the way, either of you, I'm interested in, you know, your thoughts on this sort of near-term problem of chip shortages and how Taiwan plays into that. Um, but but the question here is, um, uh, uh, you mentioned TPP is important in supply chain issues, uh, Suzuki-sensei. Um, do, you, do you think Taiwan should be in TPP? Um, would Japan support that? Um, and I'm going to add to that, you know, should the United States be in TPP? Well, I, 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 I think um, Taiwan, uh, I wish Taiwan can be a part of TPP, but I think it's going to be a declaration of war against China. So I think uh, we need to think carefully about how to involve Taiwan into the supply chain network and make sure that we may have some individual bilateral uh, frameworks and connect to the TPP or some some way that try to go around to make sure that uh, you know this is not going to come to to escalate to much more wider uh, international conflict. But I I, I think the uh, economic rationale tells Taiwan needs to be a part of TPP. Uh, so um, but that's that's different uh, from the political rationale. So it's it's hard. Uh, United States in TPP. Yes, it was originally thought that the, the, the TPP is all about Japan and the United States working together and try to make sure that we, we have more um, stronger ties and to try to diversify our, our dependency on China. But I think it's all up to Biden administration, or it's it's all up to the you know the economic situation in the United States. If uh, as long as the free trade agreement is considered to be an enemy of the middle class, um, it's uh, it's not going to be a very uh, uh, I, I I don't have high hope that the Biden administration will be very enthusiastic on joining the TPP. Okay, uh, neither do I, but I, I think eventually the logic of having to be involved in broader regional integration in Asia is going to ultimately lead to our signaling and a, a desire to long-term rejoin or join something like that uh, with possibly you know smaller steps towards it. But that's my view, which is not widely shared. Um, and I know there's strong view in the Biden administration against that, that, that you know, over our dead body, are we going to rejoin TV? But I think that may, that dynamic still may play out, especially as the president gets ready to go to Asia in November, um, and right. he'll have to develop some sort of economic strategy for the region. So that's a personal editorial comment. Um, Anya, there's an interesting question about Oran, Oran, which you mentioned, this sort of horizontal, um, you know, procurement of, of telecom equipment idea um, as an alternative, this sort of vertical solution that that uh, Huawei and, and the European companies um, provide. And actually this person links it interestingly to kind of US soft power or our, our development in the world that um, this person says, I recall Facebook partnered with Telefonica and CAF, CAF, to develop telecom infrastructure based on disaggregated technologies in rural Peru. Do you see a convergence of tech industrial policy and development aid policy under the Biden administration seems like a smart way to counter the Chinese. And I guess, you know, you can take that in either direction and sort of how the U.S. might counter. I mean, if China's going out, because we may have blocked Huawei, but, but you know, most of Africa and Latin America and the rest of Asia um, have not. And, you know, they're pushing out a lot of digital infrastructure. The U.S., you know, kind of isn't responding to that in any particular way, uh, maybe other than telling these in 
Trump administration telling these countries not to buy Huawei stuff, but there's no kind of other offering. You know, is there something we could be creative doing? That's one way to take it. The other way to take it is, Oran, you know, is controversial. And, and some people like Bill Barr, the former Trump attorney general at CSIS a year or so ago, gave a speech saying it's pie in the sky, I think was the term he used, not something that's likely to actually be implementable in, you know, kind of reasonable time frame. Um, you know, tell me if you think that or other alternatives to the kind of Huawei model would would be feasible. Those are kind of two different paths, but either one. All very good questions. And I apologize, there's piano class going on in the no background. Problem. I have a dog barking too, so no problem. <laughs> so on Oran, I am not a technologist in 5G. I just read generally about it. And the problem with all of these issues is that there are big corporate lobbies behind each of them. So there are people arguing strenuously that it's the best thing ever. There are people arguing that it'll never work. It'll put Nokia and Ericsson out of business. There's some people who have a whole third proposal that I know have a lot of, these guys have a lot of clout in Washington. So um, I don't want to weigh in on the tech fight. Politically, it would make sense to not have one company own the whole stack vertically in 5G or 6G. Because one of the big problems you were facing with Huawei is that so many countries built their 4G networks on Huawei. And then in order to switch to somebody else for 5G, you have to rip everything out and start over, enormously expensive. That's part of the reasons that's so difficult. So from what reading I've done, having, you know, Rakuten is doing it, DISH is doing, starting to roll it out in the US. So I, I think it will be feasible. Plus I think the US, there, there's a bill out there that the US House has passed, but not that yet the Senate to put in 750 million in funding for ORAM, that's a good start. Uh, the UK government pledged 250 million uh, pounds. So people are thinking about it and it's really gaining traction. I mean, from nothing, now you've got the big four European telcos came out with a memorandum of understanding and support of it at the end of last year. So in my view, it's getting some traction. That's Oran. Digital Silk Road, <laughs> very difficult because of course the West isn't gonna um, throw the amount of concessionary loans out there that China is. But I do think we are pushing back and in some way Belt and Road, um, has within it the seeds of its own demise. More and more, you know, if you went to South Africa, Latin America, other places five years ago, everybody wanted to talk about China and their largesse in terms of infrastructure, including digital. Now people are more skeptical. And so I think just sticking to it's old fashioned and it's slow, but promoting Western values of openness and not being owned by a particular company or country on the digital Silk Road, I think will go a long way towards ameliorating what the Chinese are doing. Not everywhere, obviously not with the authoritarians. Thanks. Okay, in the shameless advertising department, let me say that in the economics program at CSAS, we have an initiative called Reconnecting Asia. And my colleague, John Hillman, who directs that, is taking that into the sort of digital infrastructure space and really doing a lot of work. He's writing a book on this. And, and so I commend to you, reconnectingasia.csas.org, end of advertisement. So um, I'm gonna ask you, because we've only got one minute left, each to give one minute of, of roundup um, uh, thoughts, anything that we didn't touch on or that you'd like to say to emphasize anything you did say. So I'll start with Suzuki-san and then I'm gonna throw in a kicker uh, for you, Suzuki-san, because we never answered the Olympics question. Do you think Japan is gonna go forward with the Tokyo Olympics and should it go forward uh, with the Olympics? Yes or no? Um, should, no. Um, I, I think it's, uh, that we are way past the, the time limit and I think it's, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the controlling the pandemic is, is, uh, is the best way of controlling pandemics is to, to control the, uh, the flow of hum, uh, human, tra uh, the human movement. So I think uh, uh, Olympic is going to be the super spreader. Uh, event uh, uh, unless we have the you know the, we have the miracle and the, everyone has the vaccine in the, all over the world. Um, uh, the last point that I like to make is that 
I, I think uh, the bringing Europe is is extremely important. I think uh, you mentioned in the um, Anya's uh, question, bringing Europe is extremely important. They have been emphasizing this European autonomy because of the Trump administration. You know, there are lots of uh, unilateral uh, imposition of the um, uh, U- U.S. policies on on Europe, and that has been the problem. And they are reviving this uh, European autonomy issue. But I, I think um, the Biden administration will be able to mend it, and you know, to, to have some massage on the, on the European shoulders. And I think there will be uh, more chances for the Japan, U.S., and Europe uh, to get an uh, alliance on the tech issue as well as the market and commerce issue. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Suzuki Sensei. Anya, any final thoughts? Sure. China is an impressive innovation power, but they haven't caught up yet and they're not 10 feet tall. We do not need to emulate them for the reasons discussed in the in the first panel. Uh, but we do need to get our own house in order in the United States. We've been resting on our laurels for too long. We're no longer solidly in the lead and all the technologies that matter. And there are such great low hanging fruit of things we can do together with Japan from joint basic research, joint standards, everything we've been talking about today. So I look forward to working with my Japanese friends on those. Terrific. Thanks. What a great benediction. A nice way to end. Um, uh, uh, good um, good um, thought and spirit. Appreciate that. Thank you both, uh, Suzuki Sensei, Anya, for terrific insights. We could have gone on for hours. Thank you to our audience for staying up late, especially here in Washington, and to our friends in Japan and elsewhere for, for staying with us. Um, really rich conversation. I think Um, A lot of us are doing work on various aspects of these issues and are happy, I think, if I can say on behalf of all of our speakers, um, to follow up uh, individually on on any of these topics. Um, And um, thank you all again. Have a good night here. Have a good day in Japan. And uh, and thank you to JIA and Sasai-san for partnering with us on this. With that, I will close the proceedings. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark.